Hello out there. Let me know if you can hear me. Leave a comment. I am broadcasting from somewhere in the deep southwest United States. I am quite, quite uh, interested to review this recent article that I saw published last week. It's not really a publication. It's uh, really a comment, maybe a Jeremiah. I don't know how else to describe it. It uh, caught me by surprise how much uh, folks were uh, intrigued by this. Um, I don't know how good the audio quality is. I'm, as I said, I'm on vacation. I cannot comment. Have access to too much uh, in terms of my recording quality. Uh, but I want to block out as much of the sound effects from little screaming kids that I might hear. Um, So I want to take this opportunity to go through this popular article called The Big Bang Didn't Happen, and uh, I want to address some of the concerns that I've heard about it from professional colleagues, uh, some outright just dismissing it, calling it utter nonsense, not worthy of, uh, of contention. But, um, but uh, I don't think it's, it's entirely as instructive to just outright dismiss it and say it's, it's completely wrong, even though I'm going to outline 10 reasons uh, why I do think it's wrong. And I want to do that more as a way to describe uh, how to look at scientific popularization and when media claims are made. How do you know if it's clickbait? If you're not a professional scientist, and there's a famous saying, it might be Carl Sagan, who said, you know, it takes 10 times as much emphasis to, uh, to refute, I think he said nonsense or BS. Um, we'll keep it clean in case any of my kids come through the room. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, it takes 10 times as much energy, let's say, to refute a claim than to make a claim. And yet the claim uh, for such a weighty, um, topic as saying the Big Bang didn't happen. Uh, really, the onus is on the claimant, not on the uh, proponents of the uh, current paradigm. Doesn't mean the paradigm is entirely correct. I'm going to outline some of the things in the um, in the article that I think you know they're worthy of of uh, you know further investigation, perhaps. But I want to take this opportunity as again my role in this channel and my podcast is to teach you to think as scientifically as possible. If you're a scientist or a non-scientist, if you're a graduate student, I kind of think of this as kind of like office hours and wanting to uh, portray it in a way that um, anybody can understand and hopefully get uh, insight into the nature of which of these claims are worthy of your attention. Is this just clickbait, uh, in other words? So uh, so let's get started. I want to share my screen. This is the first of these live streams. I'm going to do another one pretty soon. I'm coming up on uh, the goal I set for this channel way back when, uh, when I first started, was to get to the most important number in all of science, which is to get... 69,420 subscribers. Um, We're less than 100 away, I believe, from that very important number, very significant number. So, um, and then I'm going to shut the channel down. Uh, No, I'm not going to do that. Uh, I really enjoy this. Uh, This is my first kind of AMA style thing that I've done in a while. I will do a proper AMA in the coming weeks, maybe on my birthday in early September. If and when we do hit 70,000 subscribers, that'll be fun. Uh, and, uh, and so I, uh, hopefully you'll have an opportunity to ask some questions and I'll let you know about that. But for now, I was alerted to this by, you know, someone very, very well known in the media, uh, but not entirely liked by everyone on this, uh, on this channel who uh, asked me if this is real or should I take this article, the big bang didn't happen or never happened. Should I take that seriously? So I want to, um, uh, first call up the paper. Uh, or the article, rather. And this is in IAI News, which is the Institute for Art and Ideas. There's a link in the video description below. So click on that. Um, Click on a a thumbs up if you're interested in learning more about this, too. Just give me some some, uh, encouragement. And uh, so I'm going to zoom in on the article. Let's see if I can do this. Um, This has a new computer. There it is. So you guys can all see that, I hope. And I'll scan through the article in real time. So 
The claim by Eric Lerner, who is a well-known person, even though I didn't really know much about him, he is the president and chief scientist of LPP Fusion. And he is the author of a very similar titled book to this article called The Big Bang Never Happened. Now, that was one of my first kind of, uh, I won't say warning signs, but but sort of a maybe a red flag that came in. <laughs> um, and that was, you know, whether or not we can really say uh, there's any, there's complete lack of interest in, in uh, you know, in a personal sense uh, from this particular individual. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to speculate on why or why not he would write this to, you know, is it to sell a book? Is it to, um, is it to, you know, get attention for something? But you always have to ask, are there, are there non-scientific motivations at work? Um, so, um, uh, so we'll take a look through the article and we'll ask ourselves, you know, about the, uh, the underlying claims and if they have merit. And I think that's, that's the uh, sense. I have about 15, 20 minutes before I have to go take care of a kid um, who may or may not pop through the door at any moment. So I'll move the door camera away. Um, and I'm a little bit under the weather, so I hope you guys appreciate this. Uh, I do want you to uh, say so. Uh, stay tuned on Sunday. I'm putting out a feature link video, a 30 minute video, part of a 30 minute thesis um, conversation that uh, describes how um, uh, the universe's formation of the lightest elements, the hydrogen in this water, was formed. And that's part of Big Bang nucleosynthesis, which is one of the three major pillars that makes us believe with great insight into the Big Bang's veracity. And even the author, Eric, claims that that is true, that the formation of the elements, although he disputes the, the uh, totality of the elements, he says that actually only one element in particular, and actually it's an isotope of hydrogen, he claims to be evidence for the Big Bang, um, but uh, everything else is dismissed by him. Uh, and that's an isotope of hydrogen called deuterium. I also have a video coming up about deuterium and why it's so important and, in a video that I'm calling in the most expensive water in the universe. Okay, so let's look at this article. Um, again, this is an IAI. I just did a recent um, uh, event for them where I described the uh, I described the uh, well. I was a host and moderator between uh, Carlo Rovelli, Eric Weinstein, and Sabina Hassenfelder with a discussion of uh, the reality of quantum mechanics. So I'm affiliated with the Institute for Arts and Ideas, and they've invited me to speak. They actually invited me to speak in September where Eric is going to be at uh, their Festival of Arts and Ideas or the How the Lights Gets In Festival. I, I couldn't make it. Oh, yeah, see, there it is. Eric Lerner will be speaker at our upcoming festival, How the Light Gets In, London 2022. I was invited. I can't make it. Um, teaching and so forth. So uh, I'll miss out on that. But one of my friends, Priya Naratajan, professor at Yale, she is apparently going to be debating him. So if you're in England, if you're in the UK, make sure to check it out. Um, so uh, the IAI is a well-known, um, uh, d d you know, pr uh, is a well-known project, I suppose, to um, to bring science and artistic ideas to the to the general public. Uh, and so I, I like them. I support. Them. I don't. I don't work for them. I don't get anything from them um, except uh, you know the intellectual satisfaction of uh, debating with uh, friends like Carlo and Sabina and Eric. Anyway, okay. So everyone who sees the James Webb Telescope. A space telescope image of the cosmos are beautifully awe-inspiring. Okay, that's true. Um, and that's not at all predicted by theory. Okay, so there's the first thing. So what they're showing is that all these images in cosmology, they're extremely surprising. They're not at all expected. Lots of surprises and not necessarily pleasant ones. One paper's title begins with candid title of, um, uh, begins with, the title panic. Okay. Candid explanation. So let's see, what is that? What is he talking about there? So, I mean, panic, that must mean the big bang's totally uh, farcical, right? So let's, let's, uh, let's investigate. Let's click on this link and see what does it bring up? Panic at the disks. First rest frame optical observations of galaxy structure at Z greater than three with JWST in the smacks of the field. This is actually by written by the third author is a former guest on the podcast, Christopher Consley's professor in the UK. Obviously, this is not saying panic, you know, <laughs> that the Big Bang Theory is wrong, as this uh, guy starts off, Eric starts off his article, as if to, you know, bring uh, some doubt and dispute, and, and cosmologists are in a state of panic. No, they're not in a state of panic. 
uh, this is a joke, a tongue-in-cheek article. And I would be surprised if this actually gets uh, uh, published with the title Panic. Um, it's obviously a, a reference, a callback to the um, well-known uh, popular music band, the Panic at the Disco. So they're just being cute. I think it's kind of funny. And um, I don't think there's anything wrong with starting a paper like this. Now, what's surprising is that Christopher Consolis is the editor of AppJ, <laughs> or one of the editors of AppJ, and he may um, he may actually have a uh, you know uh, a say and override in this paper's title actually getting published. Okay, so let, let's just take it for granted that this book, this paper is not about saying that people should panic. They're talking about the surprising result that a greater than one point five disk galaxies dominate over the overall fraction of morphologies, with a factor of ten higher number deaths than seen by the Hubble Space Telescope at these redshifts. Now, why would that be a crisis? Why would that? Why should that be a problem? Well, according to Eric, the Big Bang didn't happen, so the universe is much, much older. And in the Big Bang model, the universe is only uh, 13.7 billion years old. Therefore, it shouldn't have enough time to spin up these galaxies into uh, the configurations that they're known as spinning galaxies or disk galaxies. Now, that could be because the previous telescope, Hubble, was not designed to even have the capability to see galaxies at these high redshifts. So actually, I think that there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of, I don't want to say honesty or, or integrity, but but the point is, is that the Hubble Space Telescope was not capable of seeing galaxies at these high redshifts. So it's not so surprising that when you have a new tool like this, you're going to see things that your other uh, telescope wouldn't have seen. Imagine if, you know, Hubble using the Mount Wilson 100-inch telescope in Los Angeles, had said, uh, well, you know, I see so many galaxies and they're so far away from us. Um, and, and then when the Palomar Observatory in San Diego County was uh, opened up 200 inches, it has four times the collecting area. It can see things four times fainter or even more. Uh, and it's, oh, well, it's inconsistent with what uh, with what Hubble saw in Mount Wilson. Well, of course it is because it has more capability. So it's going to have a more finer um, tooth comb to filter out things that Hubble couldn't see. There's another issue in that he doesn't address, but any proper scientist should address this, is that the calibration of the of the James Webb Telescope is actually uh, a, process, a work in progress. It's not that we have uh, you know ultimate confidence in the calibration of it. Um, and now we, we talk about uh, they're blatantly contradicting the hypothesis of the Big Bang. So, um, so th th now he also goes in, let's switch back screens now, back to the uh, paper review. So that's the first thing. So he's, he's trying to sow doubt in the, in the reader's mind. And, and of course, this gets spun up in the press. Oh, man, astronomers in chaos, in a panic, uh, they're, everything that we thought is wrong. Um, of course, it's going to get headlines, and, and he knows this, and and uh, and it's a little disappointing that that um, you know so much is being made in the popular press. Um, and you know this when you know your grandmother or your grandfather starts asking you about these things. Oh, the Big Bang didn't happen. Um, so um, now these galaxies, what he shows are James W. O. S. C. galaxies show the same size galaxies near to us. Now there's nothing quantitative about that, and actually it's known that in a expanding universe there will be a minimum size of galaxies. Uh, so galaxies can be no smaller than a certain size, and that's called the angular diameter distance. I have a video about that someday uh, coming out. Uh, but but the bottom line is that we don't have any reason to suspect that galaxies should be smaller or bigger than a given size, which is a constant size of about an arc minute or so. And, um, and he's saying that it's not at all consistent with what's expected of this. Now, redshifts up to five, etc. And there was a lot made in the very first couple of days where these data are picked from. Uh, and that was, uh, that was you know, saying that galaxies were made at redshifts of 10 and 20, much, much higher redshift. Some of those have been retracted. Um, and there is an, uh, a normal rush to get uh, data out and to get it analyzed and be the first to make a claim about the existence of galaxies at extremely high redshift, which equates to extremely young ages. And of course, what Eric Lerner is, Dr. Lerner is trying to do here is to criticize the Big Bang for not having enough capacity or enough age to both um, create galaxies, have galaxy formation, and also have galaxies to start spinning up and have galactic rotation. So, you know, those are legitimate criticisms. And yet we have to first make sure that the, uh, that the calibration between redshift and distance is calibrated. And 
of course, in his model, what he's doing is doing something that I actually have a connection to, um, and that is via um, one of my colleagues, two of my colleagues at UCSD. So what he starts with was tiny and smooth galaxies mean no expansion and thus no Big Bang. So he is claiming his model, which is a form of plasma cosmology, we'll get into that in just a second, that plasma cosmology accounts for how this uh, the universe uh, is actually structured. In a plasma model such as his, uh, there is no expansion and therefore there's no Big Bang. And the Big Bang is the inevitable consequence of a universe that's expanding in that if you trace the clock backwards, you get a universe that's much smaller and denser, hotter than in uh, its current phase. So he's trying to cast down on it. This is what he's trying to do. Uh, and that's all fine. Uh, but he has an agenda. Obviously, he has an agenda that he wants to promulgate his cosmological model. And there's a danger that you'll account anything um, uh, as evidence for your theory and everything as evidence against another theory. Um, so, uh, so he's got on about this merger process uh, and how this has, has actually not been successful. I should also point out some of the features of uh, of his cosmology, which have not changed. So this is point number three, I think, of my 10. Uh, so the first one is that the, uh, the, the um, you know, to state the Big Bang never happened and then claim things, anything like panic in the title is really evidence that uh, cosmology is in crisis because of a title of a paper. I think that's kind of specious, to be honest. Um, it's it's kind of tongue in cheek. Maybe he's not super serious about it. Who knows? Um, number two, calibration uh, has not been applied. Number three, he's got an agenda, a model. Um, so his his colleagues um, uh, and and, uh, and and he are trying to uh, are trying to postulate that you don't need to have a big bang to have the structures that we've seen in the universe since uh, the, these data have come out. Now, what's interesting is that his model. His model came out in 1991, um, and that was before even the COBE satellite data had been released, showing that there were fluctuations in what he calls the alleged or supposed uh, cosmic microwave background. Let me see if I can find what he calls it. Um, uh, asymmetries in the microwave background that should not exist. Let's see here. That drive cosmic evolution, micro background um, phenomena that we observe. Okay, so we're going to get into this topic in just a bit. Um, can be explained uh, using laboratory. Okay, in other in other uh, uh, works, he's dismissed the cosmic microwave background uh, completely, saying it, it is not based on it's not uh, to be counted as evidence for the uh, hot, dense early phase of the Big Bang. So he says, and this is something could have existed before the Big Bang. I mean, nobody's claiming that uh, existed in the Big Bang model, although there are mo models, as we talked about a month ago with Anna Aegis, the bouncing cosmology. There are uh, structures and structure formation, isocurvature fluctuations, things like that that can take place in so-called bouncing or cyclic models. He's dismissing those completely. Um, he doesn't believe in a cyclic model. Okay, so just as there's the Big Bang, if the Big Bang hypothesis were valid, theorists should expect that JWST looked farther out in space and back in time. There should be fewer and fewer galaxies and eventually none. A dark age in the cosmos. Well, okay, so there is a dark age in the cosmos and it's before the earliest galaxies that are shown in the JWST data. Uh, so, so there are blank spots in the, cosmic, um, in the cosmic web. In fact, what he dismisses completely as the result of what's called a cosmic screening, we'll talk about that in just a bit. Um, uh, that cosmic microwave background is a dark. There are no galaxies when the CMB is produced, the 380,000 or 370,000 years after the Big Bang. He can't explain that. So, um, so there are actual blank spots in the cosmic structure formation history. Now he's saying, while well, Big Bang theorists were shocked and panicked by these. So again, he's he's equating like all these all these theorists. By the way, the papers that were published. Um, with that title, or I was submitted, it's not published. And I think it's, it's very, you have to be very careful if you're a good scientist. I'm saying this to my students and to people that want to know how to assess both publicly disseminated information and actual scientific data. You have to be very careful with what you quote and what you accuse people of believing. And you have to be extremely careful of what you, how you account and what you're considering people to be. So first of all, the paper that's published, a panic, those are not theorists. 
They are not theorists. They are observers. So not getting, not understanding who you're talking to and what the data and what they're representing. It's as egregious as, you know, going into an Apple store and getting, asking for a, a Samsung phone. It, it demonstrates a lack of professional courtesy, let me just say. And we'll see later that uh, Eric, uh, Dr. Lerner, he is uh, no stranger to making accusations against the scientific community, which is another one of my warning signs, the 10 warning signs. So, um, so they're saying they're shocked and panicked. Nobody has been panicked about these new results. Again, he is creating a false narrative that people are in a crisis and that um, luckily we have his model, which, by the way, has been around um, since many of you, before many of you were born, that are watching. Certainly any of my students that are watching. Um, 1991. So it's a 31-year-old uh, uh, paper, a book that he has been um, continually harping on. And that book was written before the uh, discovery, seven years before the discovery of dark energy a year before the Kobe results were announced. And yet, as new data have come in, there's been absolutely no new progress in this model. It's just the same model that's been recycled since the time of a man by the name of Alfane. And so we'll talk about that. Let's go down here. So, um, so what he talks about uh, here is cosmology and crisis. You see all these different references, et cetera. Until the past three years, if a research could self-fund cosmology research as a silent, as in the case with me, they could still publish heretical papers. So this brings me to a fifth or sixth point that I, I always like to make a point. Of. You should never accuse scientists of being um, a cabal of acting uh, and that there's uh, censorship going on. I joke with my students, never compare yourself to Einstein and never compare yourself to Giordano Bruno, who of course was burned at the stake for his truly heretical ideas. Um, at the heretical to the Catholic Church in the year 1600, he was burned at the at the stake. Um, now, why shouldn't you do that? Well, I think a lot of times you try to conflate your ideas with the ideas of people that were persecuted. I often get arguments like this mailed to me. Professor Keating, um, I have this new idea for a cosmological model. Everybody's wrong. Um, I know you might think I'm crazy. They thought Einstein was crazy. Uh, but look what happened with him. Uh, so if you help me, the implication goes, then I will help you and we'll split the Nobel Prize. Um, and uh, so the, uh, uh, the the conflation is always between someone great or someone who is persecuted for heretical ideas. It's very loaded terminology. It's not proper scientific terminology, and it's hard to take it seriously. Um, I wouldn't take it super seriously at this point, um, other than the fact that, uh, you know, he, he has every right to make legitimate claims and concerns against the Big Bang, um, but he's clearly advocating a position, a position that he has held unwaveringly since 1991, despite all the new evidence that's come out for the cosmological model, despite dozens or half a dozen Nobel Prizes that have gone to what's called the standard model of cosmology, namely that the universe it has been expanding for over 13.7 billion years, and it's predicated on three pillars of uh, that need to be explained uh, in his model or any other alternative. And I did a wonderful episode with my friend you know, Garrett Lewis and Luke Barnes about two years ago now called the Cosmic Revolutionaries Handbook. And such a um, and such a treatment says that if you have a revolutionary new idea, here's the list of things you have to overcome. In other words, you have to explain everything that's explained currently. And more, you have to make new predictions. Otherwise, you're just adding on epicycles. So the question is, does his model explain more than the so-called standard model? The standard model of cosmology features a Big Bang, features dark matter and dark energy. Do we know what those are? No, nope, we don't know what those are. We didn't know what 90% of the periodic table was until the last 80 years. So I don't think that's a, uh, you know, a true criticism. Um, it doesn't mean that we'll never know it. Now, if we if we never have any insight and we just get stuck in a rut and just keep looking for the same exact thing, yeah, you could criticize it. He doesn't believe in dark matter. He doesn't believe that the universe is expanding, let alone that the expansion is accelerating, for which we have copious evidence. He doesn't believe this cosmic microwave background is cosmic. He doesn't believe in the redshift of galaxies. And he doesn't believe that the um, that the that most of the lightest elements in the periodic table were formed during a hot, dense phase of the universe because there was no hot, dense phase of the universe. So he has to form those in very exotic uh, scenarios. 
And uh, he's been doing this, as I said, for so long now, almost over three decades, um, that uh, that some people have actually criticized it. And we can look at the errors in this. This is a wonderful um, website that you should always look at, uh, run by my uh, friend and professor colleague at UCLA. Um, and his name is Ned Wright. And Ned Wright uh, has a whole you know web page dedicated to this. And it's called Errors in the Big Bang Never Happened. Uh, and so he first goes through the criticisms of the Big Bang, errors and alternatives to the Big Bang, and then miscellaneous errors. So back then, I think this, I forget when this uh, critic, this paper came, this this website rather came out, let's see, let me scan down to the, so this hasn't been modified since 2003. Um, and a lot has happened since 2003, including the Nobel Prize for the discovery of dark energy uh, by past guests, Brian Schmidt and Adam Reese. You should look for episodes by them on this uh, channel. Um, so even back this time, uh, there was enough to dispute in this uh, work, uh, this proposal by Lerner. So now we're criticizing the critique, the alternative model. It's one thing to criticize a model. It's another thing to come up with another model that doesn't do as good a job as the model that you're disputing. So, um, and, and oftentimes one of the signs that you're dealing with somebody whose motives um, may not be aligned with what you are uh, uh, looking for, which is the ultimate scientific truth, is that they not only prove somebody else wrong, but they also want to prove themselves right. And it's very difficult to do uh, both, either one of those, let alone both of those. So, um, so he goes through, and it, even back then, he was talking about how hard it was to make uh, clusters of galaxies at large uh, at large times. So he's still saying that in this IAI paper, right? So he's saying, to give an example, 150 million light year sheet of galaxies. Uh, this is in his book. So he's talking about superclusters and how could superclusters form. This is in 2003. Ned Wright is dismissing the 1991 book by Lerner of almost the same name. Structures take too long to grow, learning a value of 1,000 kilometers a second and 75 million light years, H naught, which is the expansion rate of the universe today. We find perfect agreement as long as omega, which is the, which is the energy density of the universe, is close to one. Now, in 2003, when Ned Wright was writing this, we had already measured that omega was close to one. But in 1991, we hadn't. We didn't know if the universe was open or closed, if it had greater than or negative uh, less than. Uh, the critical density, which is what omega equals one means. And we didn't know the Hubble constant to better than, you know, 10% or 20% uncertainty. Now we know it to two or 3% uncertainty. And as you'll see, that's a critical ingredient. And so he hasn't updated his same argument. In other words, he's recycling the same argument that there's not enough time to grow. Um, even though in the time that he's written the book, 30 years later, we've refined the values of the input parameters of the Big Bang model that he's claiming are wrong. Now he also talks about the the spectral behavior of the um, of the Big Bang uh, as measured by the um, by the Kobe satellite and uh, others uh, as well, and because of that he um, he has a critique about not only the existence of the cosmic microwave background but of its fluctuations as well. Oh wait, I'm not I'm not how about this. So I had an interloper, graduate student came to bother me. Um, so I got to wrap up in a few minutes because the graduate students are restless. Um, so uh, I do want to go through a couple more of the highlights. Okay. Um, so he claims, again, uh, we, we, uh, he actually references his model, which is a form of plasma cosmology. That was first popularized by a professor at UC San Diego, where I am. His name was uh, Al, Al Vane. Um, he won the Nobel Prize, and that's often used as a uh, as a way to bolster the um, that he wanted for plasma physics. And he claimed that plasma pervaded the cosmos, and that there was no Big Bang. Now, why did Al Vane want to show there was no Big Bang? Al Vane wanted to show there was no Big Bang because he believed that that was used as evidence by creationists to support the biblical narrative of the Genesis event. So that wasn't a pure purely motivated theory by Al Fain. <laughs> uh, he had ideas and, 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 and complaints, and that was 50 years ago. Uh, and so now we have, um, we have Eric Lerner, Dr. Eric Lerner, recycling this model. Although according to Ned Wright, Ned Wright says that he abandoned the plasma cosmology in the response that he had to, uh, uh, to uh, what, what 
what Ned Wright had put out. So in other words, Lerner said in a response to Ned Wright, he said, I disavow this uh, this model. <laughs> he says, uh, Ned Wright, I'm just reading, I'm not going to switch back to the website. Remarkably, Lerner now disowns the Alvin Klein model, which plays such a big part in his book, and wants me to give the proper attribution. He points out that he listed now, but but now in the IAI paper, he's citing the uh, the Alphane paper, okay? So he's talking about the Nobel Prize winner, Alphane, uh, so which is it? Do you disown it? Do you do you not disown it? Um, disavow it rather. And uh, so I find this very, very, uh, I, I don't want to say misleading, but uh, it's certainly uh, kind of playing a distraction. Okay, so there it is. These scientific questions matter here now for decades. Scientists starting with physics Nobel laureate Hans Alvane have shown that the Big Bang hypothesis is thrown out. The evolution of the cosmos that we observe today, like the CMB, can be explained using physical processes observed in the laboratory. Well, wouldn't that be great? Except that if the universe is not expanding, he cannot explain how the CMB exists at high redshifts. We observe the CMB. This is the most damning evidence, I think, about, and um, it didn't exist maybe as, as highly accurately as it does now, uh, and the time that Ned Wright wrote his, um, wrote his dismissal and disproof of the learner model. But instead, he, uh, he, he did not know and he does not cite the fact that if you measure the cosmic temperature uh, of the microwave background, it changes as a function of redshift. And we measured that in different galaxies. How can you possibly explain that in a universe that's not expanding? He has no answer for that. In fact, he's dismissive of the CMB. He believes it's due to like some scattering effects, which have been disproven for decades. And again, I am not you know, averse to, to tackling and to engaging with people who have alternative ideas. Don't forget, I'm probably the only person who's ever interviewed Giant Narlikar, who was Hoyle's best graduate student, probably, arguably. Uh, Fred Hoyle was the pr biggest proponent and opponent of the Big Bang. He gave the name Big Bang to the Big Bang model as an insult to the Big Bang because he thought it was so preposterous. And allegedly, it's a it's a British you know euphemism for orgasm or something, uh, and so he wanted to humiliate people that believed in explosive or because Hoyle also was against the creation Genesis one one narrative, um, and Hoyle and uh, Narlikar worked very closely together, and they worked together with Jeffrey Burbage and Margaret Burbage, and I sit in Jeffrey Burbage's office at UC San Diego. So I've interviewed uh, Jeffrey many times before he passed away 12 years ago. Uh, we chatted many times about cosmology. He went to his grave believing the Big Bang never happened and so-called quasi-steady state cosmology, which has been utterly disproven, as I talk about in my book, Losing the Nobel Prize, my first book. Um, but I interviewed Giant Laurel Carr. I love talking to him. Uh, and uh, and I think you can learn a lot from people, even if you disagree with them violently about their particular ideas. But why are they doing this? What is this about? Why are they trying to do this? And uh, that's my goal. I want to teach you to look at these things. So the last thing I want to talk about besides, so I talked about, you know, um, how does he explain uh, the CMB? He doesn't. There's another thing that he can't explain. In a universe that has uh, no expansion and everything is moving gravitationally, why do we see some galaxies getting blue shifted? Why are they getting gravitationally attracted to us? What, how does he explain general relativity where if you have any mass density, the universe cannot be static. It cannot be unevolving. He doesn't have a good explanation. So he has to come up with all these epicycles in his model. And it's not the first time this has ever happened. It's the first time because of the rise of Twitter and the internet that I'll get emails and messages from all over the world uh, 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 asking about this. How does he explain that? How does he explain the evolution of the redshift dependence of the CMB in a universe that's not expanding? How does he explain the changing Hubble constant due to the presumed evolution uh, of the universe during expansion? How does he explain that the uh, that there existence of dark energy, which we measure not only from supernovae, but we measure it from the CMB alone? Um, and that is uh, left unexplained. The last thing I want to conclude with is something you always need to do and you need to look and, again, consider the source. What, are the, what is their motivation? Why are they writing this? Um, and so I just want to conclude with this. I'll look through a couple questions, and then I have to leave. Okay, so the pl process of plasma filamentation. Now we're getting to the good stuff. This is probably the last thing. To use fusion energy, the power that drives the universe and gives light to the sun. This is great. And the stars. We need to develop and drive that cosmic evolution. Just as the Wright brothers developed the airplane by studying how birds control their flight. I don't know that that's exactly how they did it. I think Leonardo da Vinci looked at birds controlling their flight. So today we can only control ultron plasma where fusion reactions occur by studying how plasmas behave at all scales in the cosmos. 
We need to imitate nature, not try to fight it. We at LPP Fusion have been applying that knowledge concretely. So now, now, I talk, now he starts getting into funding of these processes. The scale of the sun, work on larger scales, has been hobbled by the straitjacket of the Big Bang hypothesis, which has diverted hundreds or thousands of talented researchers into futile calculations of imaginary entities like dark matter, dark energy, that have invented to prop up a failing theory. So cosmology can emerge in this crisis. Winston established and recognized that the Big Bang never happened. So if you click on this link, now you come to where he's published his papers. Um, and uh, when he talks about he's published these papers and so forth, they only appear on his website. Um, they're not published in journal. Now he's saying there's censorship. Now, to censor an article is an incredibly difficult thing. Uh, you have to have uh, multiple referees that would agree and collaborate and collude to, uh, to and, and I like the website, by the way. If Eric, if you're watching, congratulations on this website. It's really cool animation. Take it from me. Um, I don't know anything about your uh, fusion processes, but I dislike the kind of conflation again of the universe uh, and the incorrectness of the Big Bang Theory with now uh, we need more funding for the type of fusion research that I'm doing. Uh, I think that smacks of a conflict of interest personally. Uh, and while it might be noble and there might be, in other words, you might be able to say, well, people are, are not funding my cosmic uh, researches uh, and they're not funding my fusion research. Therefore, you know, I'm being censored and, and ostracized at the highest levels. To get ostracized from, from journal articles, almost impossible. Um, he's, he's talking about get, and not being allowed to publish. Uh, I think that that's, those are kind of very bold statements. He has published uh, before um, in, in some journal articles, as he mentioned. I don't think that there's, um, you know, much point. Now, I look through the articles. They're 60 pages long. And that brings me to the final point. Again, uh, quoting from uh, quoting from uh, Carl Sagan, I think, or I don't even know who it was from. But it takes 10 times as much energy to refute. I don't want to say any bad words, okay, guys? Uh, you fill, in, fill in, you know, the blank here. To refute BS <laughs> uh, than it does to produce. I'm not calling him BS. I think he's probably very knowledgeable about science. This is what I find often, that people are like so down the rabbit hole. They haven't really collaborated. They haven't been involved in university settings. Uh, they're, they're trying to come out of left field using this argument that, you know, work for Einstein or work for me. Um, and so I wanted to just, you know, alert you when you see articles like this, go through the links, take them seriously, take Eric, take people like him seriously. He will be debating, you know, one of the foremost cosmologists in the world, Priya Natarajan at, uh, at how the light gets in festival. I hope that'll be great. I hope they'll get a, uh, a good turnout. Um, and, uh, I hope maybe she can, you know, even substantiate more with what I am talking about from her expertise in black holes and formation of those objects and how they anchor and, and behave in time of galaxies. Um, he also, as some people are mentioning, Gregory Head and others are mentioning things like, um, he, he also dismisses the abundance of light elements. And because of that, uh, that would be uh, a reason to dismiss this. Well, I don't think that's uh, exactly true at all. In fact, I have a video, as I said, on Sunday, you can find a link to it on the channel already for the premiere. So watch that video. That's about how do we know the abundances of all the lightest elements on the periodic table, not just the helium and deuterium that he's talking about. So how do we know that the universe originated from a hot, dense state? One of the biggest, most precise ways we have of doing that is measuring the abundance of light elements. And I'm going to be um, presenting as I did in my cosmology for undergraduates, advanced undergraduates classes, it's an advanced lecture, although you don't, you know, I put in a lot of entertaining jokes and my editor is really fun. Um, and so I think you'll like it even if you're not an expert, but I go through the equations and the calculations of how we know the abundance of, uh, and calculate the abundance that can only take place if the universe was once as hot as the hottest plasma fusion reactors that Eric Lerner or his colleagues could ever consider. And that's uh, tens of millions of degrees Kelvin. And that does not exist in the uh, plasma cosmology um, uh, universe. And in fact, he has to come up with other ways to form it, which the article by Ned Wright, which I'll put a link to in the show notes when I get some time, um, uh, disputes as well. He talks about another way to produce lithium and, and other, other light elements that I talk about in the video on Sunday. So make sure you uh, do click and decide. Um, so I see a lot of like, you know, questions in the, uh, in the chat. I don't have too much time. 
Uh, let's see if there, uh, let's see, could the James Webb, Simon, here, I'll add that. Uh, could the James Webb Space Telescope prove that there was no Big Bang? No, the James Webb uh, Space Telescope is not designed really to do uh, proof of the Big Bang. That's what I'm studying. I'm studying the microwave background, which is the oldest light in the universe. These are the oldest galaxies in the universe. And it's at much higher redshift than Hubble could ever see. So what do they made, mean for the age of the universe after we start out the age of the contract? It doesn't change the age of the universe at all. The age of the universe is primarily determined by its composition and uh, the Hubble constant. And we know those exquisitely well. There is tension between two different values. They can differ by at most 9 or 10%, which could differ, change the age of the universe by a billion years, but it doesn't change it by infinite number of years. Um, and so, uh, yeah, Michael, I don't know. I could interview him. Uh, I have a lot of other things on my plate, right? Um, and uh, I think this is pretty good. He's debating uh, Priya, and I think that uh, hopefully they'll make that available for people to see as well. Uh, and that's next month. Or if you're in England, go there um, and check it out. Uh, Brad S., um, you're welcome. Uh, that's great. Uh uh, paper trolls. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't consider him a troll. I think he's earnest. I think he's, you know, he's trying to do the right thing. I don't think he's doing anything, you know, scientifically untoward. I just think he has, you know, perhaps confirmation bias where he's trying to, um, uh, where he's trying to, um, you know, really motivate his model and take down the predominant one. Now it's true that we don't know what dark energy, Rob, and dark matter is. That doesn't mean we don't know, you know, we, we, we didn't know what quarks were until the 1980s and nineties, really. Uh, it doesn't mean that they didn't exist or weren't real in some sense. Okay. Uh, seriously, why, uh, I don't know what's going on here. Super sticker, uh, Shiba dog. Okay, good. Thank you, Tim. Uh, so what if he's wrong, but we need to reevaluate? Yeah, we do have to reevaluate the universe's age. That is true. We have to constantly evaluate it. And the thing is, is that if, if I thought, you know, like a quasi steady state model was right, then there'd be an infinite age effectively of the universe. And we are investigating that with things like looking to disprove, or really that's what we do as scientists. We don't look to prove models. We look to disprove them. Anyway, I got to run. It's uh, my last couple days of vacation. Uh, had a great time with you guys and uh, yeah, we'll do this again. Remember to you know, try to share the channel uh, so I can grow to that magical number, 69,420 subscribers. We'll do a, we'll do a, um, we'll do a, uh, a, a Q and a, maybe we'll do it live and you guys can ask me all sorts of crazy questions and fun questions. I'd love to answer them. And, uh, and for now, yeah, I'm enjoying, uh, enjoying the time. Don't forget Sunday. I do a deep dive. I don't, ever dumb things down guys don't ever ask me to dumb something down so you know you guys are i know some of you are truck drivers and whatever i love you guys that's so much fun to talk to you guys i think all scientists have to do this we get paid to do it except on vacation come on i gotta have a little vacation uh but the point is we get paid by you guys we owe you guys stuff and i'm doing it i'm not gonna dumb it down you're gonna enjoy the video on sunday make sure you uh set the notification bell bye everybody had fun and i'll talk to you guys soon